84 years old, still flying my RV-8, tail dragger, like God made airplanes to be, and it flies at 155 knots just like the SPAD did. So I'm happy. And anyway, I uh, got out of pilot training, became an instructor pilot up at Vance at Eno, Oklahoma. Almost five years, couldn't get out of there. They sent me off to uh, squadron officer school which kind of freed me up. The base got an assignment for Vietnam, and so I suddenly got orders to go to Vietnam, to the A-1, which I didn't know anything at all about. I was not a volunteer, but uh, how I was selected to go to A-1, I was at squadron officer school. I thought I was going to go back to Vance, and I was in line to get an RF-101, which I wanted. And uh, so I left my wife at home, their base housing, and about a month in squadron officer school, three-month course. She called me and said, you got orders to Vietnam. And surprise, surprise. So uh, got out of Vietnam, I mean out of uh, squadron off school, went to survival training up at Stead before they closed that, and then uh, to Hurlburt for the checkout. I can't remember, I think it was a three months uh, flying the A-1, mainly uh, checkout in the aircraft so you could handle it. And then it was air to ground training, which I'd never dropped anything. The training at the time was, uh, they weren't really IPs, they were just checked out pilots. I learned all my gunnery school uh, from two of my classmates uh, who were F-100 instructor pilots. I tell everybody I learned air to ground at the bar, at the officer's club. But anyway, I learned it and we went to Vietnam. I actually arrived there very early, 1964, December. Got there just before Christmas in time to see the very first Bob Hope show. And so I basically, I was there, I left December of 65, I was there the year of 65. We did train some students uh, that had gone through T-28 training, only about 100 hours. We were to check them out in the airplane, teach them air to ground, which was uh, pretty challenging because uh, some of them were so small we had to put two cushions under them and two behind them to reach the rudder pedals. But uh, we'd train them, but we'd cancel training at the drop of a hat if something hot happened. But people don't understand, when we flew combat, we had, for our cover story, we actually carried a Vietnamese airman in the right seat. He spoke no English, we spoke no Vietnamese come right down to it. The only reason he was there is if I crashed, the headlines would say, poor old John Larson busted his butt training a Vietnamese pilot. And that was our cover story. And when I give my presentation to groups, I caution them, what you're reading today's papers about Afghanistan and all that, all these advisors going over there, I said, take that with a grain of salt. The government's not above lying to you. It was mid-65, when uh, the government said, enough of this, uh, the Russians are helping the North Vietnamese and the Chinese. So they said, we're disregarding the Geneva Conventions, which said we would not introduce any modern weapons into Vietnam. And that's the story, which a lot of people don't realize, why we were flying the Navy A-1. They were looking for an airplane for the cover story. It was not a modern weapon. It was a two-seater. It fit perfect 
besides being a great air-to-ground airplane. Uh, so in mid-65, when the F-100s entered the war, we got rid of our observers. So we called them observers. They didn't observe anything. They were just a body. And the war escalated big time. And a lot of our missions changed. And it was about that time that uh, we decided to strike the SAM sites around Hanoi, which was ridiculous. We sat there and watched them build them. We had a, a U-2 flying out of Benoit, which was very classified, taking pictures of all this. We had uh, 130s carrying Farby drones taking pictures and literally sat there and watched them build that thing until it was operational and then decided to strike. And we lost a bunch of airplanes, strike airplanes. We were fragged to go to Udorn to fly low altitude rescue uh, around Hanoi for picking up those pilots. They didn't tell us to go till the morning that it occurred. So we were late getting there. And we got briefed and they said, we're not going in until we get contact with one of the down pilots on a radio. So they put us on strip alert. During that period of time, there was an AVA-4, the little sky scooter got shot down just north of the DMZ. And so they scrambled a Pedro helicopter out of Akon Phnom better known as Naked Fanny. Uh, that's the little air, the el helicopter where the blades intermix around and around like an egg beater. It has very short legs. It was not built to go anywhere. But we escorted him out to the DMZ area, picked up the Navy pilot without too much trouble, brought him back, and all the way back we're getting radio calls out of Udorn because McNamara, Secretary of Defense at the time, was on one of his whirlwind tours and he was at Udorn and they wanted that pilot back for a photo op, which had been a great photo op. The Pedro says we can't make Udorn. We don't have the fuel. So about that time I broke in and admitted my stupidity. What's this Nacon Phenom you're talking about? Or the Naked Fanny, and they told me it was Nacon Phenom. I said, well, I've got a parachute and a helmet in here for the crew chief that we brought over with us. I could pick him up and we could fly him back, me and my wingman. Okay, what kind of runway they got? 3,000 foot of PSP, no runway. We can land on that, and we did. Picked up the pilot, flew him back to Udorn. Very interesting, we taxied in the park, rows of staff cars. They grabbed that Navy pilot and never saw him again. For years later, I found out his name uh, and they ripped me and my wingmen off to intelligence. We sat across from two full colonels. I remember it vividly. They looked straight at us and said, tell us about this airplane you're flying. So we explained to them how long we could stay airborne, what all we could carry. We carry mines, we carry bombs, uh, CBUs. We could even carry a nuke. The Navy carried a nuke. Well, they were flabbergasted. They wouldn't let us go home. They kept us on strip alert for three days. Saigon finally said, we want those airplanes back at Benoit. So we were only there about four days. Within a month after we got back to Benoit, we were TDYing four airplanes on two-week TDYs to Udorn for the search and rescue missions. And then, as most people know, it was probably in 66, the whole squadron moved to Udorn once they build up the NKP, then they moved over to NKP, and the Sandy story was born. Question is, where did the Sandy call sign come from? And our organization did a lot of research, and we could never figure out where it came from. There's no foundation. During that period of time, they would rotate the call signs because they thought the VC would learn who we were, which was ridiculous. But the best story we can come up with is that some, Sandy was probably a call sign on a mission that went very well and everybody thought it was good luck. Fighter pilots are like that. So the Sandy call sign stuck. Anytime they were on a Sandy mission, it was search and rescue. They did fly forward air control. They flew FAC. They flew introduction. They flew all kinds of aircraft uh, sorties besides search and rescue. But if it was a search and rescue mission, they picked up the Sandy call sign right away. And the lead aircraft generally became the on-scene commander, Sandy One. Uh, he would take over control. Smoke, 
Uh, back up, one of my good friends, Mel Elliott, was shot down when we were in Vietnam. Actually spent the night on the ground, they couldn't get him out. Next morning they called on the PA for volunteers for a special mission. Tom Dwelly, who you'll probably see later, we just ran down there and went out and airplanes were loaded and we had these weird looking napalm tanks on that had snouts on the back and we said, what are these? And they said, they are smoke tanks. Never seen a smoke tank, never heard one talked about. But they said, don't bring them back because it's highly volatile. When the air hits it, it smokes, it ex burns. So we take off to, to put a smoke screen down so the helicopter could get up Mel. Well, they got on and picked him up just before we got there so we didn't have to expend. One of my other humorous stories on the way back, well, what are we going to do with this smoke? They said, don't bring it back. So we decided to do some sky riding. And we came up with an obscene gesture that we thought we could draw, circles and so forth. And I've got this in one of my stories, graphically. And so uh, we got over Benoit at 5,000 feet and decided to do this. Trouble is, that smoke is designed to hide people and it creates a cloud. And all we created was a big old cloud over Benoit. But to this day, if we'd have drawn that, we had been still famous in the laurels of fighter pilots as the guys that drew the, the cock and balls over Benoit. <laughs> But anyway, the uh, rest of my uh, tour was eventful. I, uh, fighter pilots do dumb things. We went on a special mission up to Da Nang, and uh, we took two extra pilots, and I jumped in the right seat, took some real good strike pictures, napalm picture, and everything, and in hindsight, I say, why in the hell, you know, I could have got shot down riding there taking pictures. Fighter pilots think they're bulletproof. In, in inevitable. And I think you got to have some of that in you to be a good fighter pilot. But anyway, that was one, uh, one case. I had it timed out. You got an air medal at 25 sortie. Every 25 sorties you got an award of an air medal. And I had it planned out to where in December I would come up right at 200 sorties. Another stupid thing. About two weeks before I was due to rotate, they had a big war going on one of the forts, and we had to go fly to help cover them, and I slipped over 200 to 210. I flew my butt off to get 225 because I wasn't leaving any sorties laying on the table. So I ended up with 225 sorties. <laughs> I retired, and now I like to do jewelry work, my hobby jewelry work, and I find I want to fly again. I bought an RV-8 home built, and I fly that, and that's my little a1 that I fly at least once a week. So, and I work very closely with the A1 sky readers. I keep, uh, I call myself a point of contact. I keep the, the rosters, class list, who's passed away, and so forth and so on. And that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> may I ask you, um, out of all the planes that you've flown, how does the Sky Raider, the A1 Sky Raider, uh, distinguish itself amongst everything that you've flown? What well, was it like? I found it, I loved the airplane. The fact the torque and the rudder control was not a problem for me for some reason, I don't know why. T-37, you had to use a little rudder on touch and goes because the engines came in different. Most jet pilots coming out of uh, 100s or F4s never use rudders. Uh, and in the A1, you damn well better use rudders. The rudder in the A1, interesting story, was rather ineffective at takeoff and landing speeds. And the problems we had, I never heard of one doing a true ground loop, but a lot of them lost directional control and ran off the runway because they would put in a little rudder when the torque took effect, a little right rudder, and nothing happened. It's still going left. Put in a little more. Okay, now it starts coming back. Now you got too much in. So you take a little out. And if you weren't good at it, you just end up over-controlling and chasing it and actually 
most of them would run off the runway at a 45 or 90 degree angle. Uh, so when I got in my little RV-8, the rudder in that was so sensitive. The first checkout ride was at New Braunfels. And people said, how did it go? And I said, man, I said, I used the whole runway. Well, how long was it? Well, it's 5,000 feet. The length had nothing to do with it. It was a width. I almost ran off both sides. <laughs> totally different rudder control. But uh, they say you can tell an A1 pop because his right leg is longer than his left from holding that right rudder. And, uh, but I love the A1. I tell people it's the best job I ever had. I worked in industry and in the Air Force. Write reports, turn them in. You'd wait weeks, months to find out whether you did good. In Vietnam, you got on a mission, you roll in on your napalm run or your dive bomb pass, and coming off the target, you could look back and see how well you did. You didn't need to wait two or three weeks to find out how well you did. And that kind of fits in one of the things I brief a lot of young guys, job satisfaction becomes very important when you get a little older like I am. That's why some things I retired from. I just was doing a good job, but I, it would just... I wouldn't get any satisfaction out of doing it. That's one of the reasons I work so much here with the A1 Sky Raider Association. Keeping track of people, putting them together and everything, I really feel good about it. I really feel bad when I have to gray line a guy out on a roster who's passed away. Uh, but that's the way it happens. So we're all aging. But I just ran into one guy, at the thing that I remember about three years ago, I had him grayed out and found out he was alive. I said, the first guy I resurrected. Man, I felt good about resurrecting him. <laughs> but that's what I'm doing now. And I'm in a couple other aviation organizations. In fact, I got a, another reunion next weekend down in Orlando, Orlando. Thank you very much, John. Is there anything else uh, that you'd like to say about, if you were going to give some words of wisdom to young men and women who were looking to go into the military, what would you say about becoming a search and rescue pilot or, or in that organization? Well, it's right off the top. It goes to what I said earlier, job satisfaction. It's got to be a very gratifying thing to save somebody's life or even attempting to save them. Even if you were unsuccessful, you tried. And I think that would be a big plus for search and rescue. Uh, I know they're highly respected. Some of the PJs, uh, parachute jumpers, uh, worked in Vietnam, and even today, they go through very rigorous training, and they are extremely respected. In Vietnam, and embarrassed one of them, he can't buy a drink. No way. <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah, and it's but it's a totally different Air Force now. It's uh, people have asked me, would you like to go back in the Air Force and fly again? I say no. It's just not the same Air Force. Uh, I, I don't like it, but I can't say it's bad. Uh, history will, will tell, but it's a totally different Air Force than uh, what we see now. And uh, so, but I still, if they're interested, and I've counseled, if you can stand regimentation and so forth, some kids don't handle that. Uh, it's a great, I've counseled some, hey, uh, don't go join the Air Force, go to college, get a degree, be an officer. Uh, but even enlisted, uh, they get excellent training if they'll get in the right career field that will pay extreme dividends to them after they get out. All kinds, admit, even my admin, admin officer, they, they learn to deal with people and training and stuff that the average guy in the street, and I spent several years in, in commercial businesses, uh, Raytheon, uh, uh, AIL, it's totally different. These people are not used to that. In the military, if we find a better way of doing something, we tell everybody about it. We have a suggestion program to tell people. It's a better way of dropping a bomb. You're more accurate. In industry, I saw just the opposite. If I tell you how to order parts better than the way you're doing it, you're, you're, you become a competitor for my job. And uh, I saw that big time in some cases. So uh, I, kids, if they really are, feel like they can, the regiment of the military life, it's a great life. 
and uh, it could pay off. Uh, I had a family member who was a Marine and uh, enlisted, and I thought, you know, what's he going to do with that? He ended up out in L.A. He and another guy went teamed together, set up a bodyguard system, and they were going to these executive meetings, and with the stars, they would hire them to be their bodyguards. Made good bucks and had a great time for several years. So you never know. Never know. Military, it's got a lot to offer. Hello, Sandy Keith, anyone? Go ahead. Are you with the Jollies this time? Uh, that's farm. Say again, Alpha. Understand you copy 82 Bravo. Golly, hold your position. Hold your position. Hello, 82 Bravo. Hello, 82 Bravo. Sandy One, go ahead. Speak slower. 82 Bravo, speak slower. Sandy One. Okay, where am I from you now? Where am I from you now? Say again, say again. Okay, I want you to go back with three and four. Go back with three and four. We'll call you to execute as soon as we find Bravo. Okay, we're going back with three and four. Alamo three, King two, seven, execute. Eight two, Bravo, Sandy one. How do you read now? You have in sight? Have me in sight? Okay, I'm going to fly down the river, down the river. Tell me when I'm over your location, over your location. A bit longer until uh, Alamo 2 gets in a little bit of shape. 